In this video, we're going to compute the electric field around a finite rod with uniform charge density. Where the observation point is located on the perpendicular bisector of the line charge, as we can see below. Now this problem naturally leads to a challenging integral that can be solved with trigonometric substitution. And most textbooks and videos will omit the calculation of this integral and simply rely on an integration table. Well, I think it's worth showing how to do it. And if you've taken two semesters of calculus, you know how to do it. And I've separated the calculation of the integral as its own chapter in the video. Finally, after getting our result, we're going to look at a couple limiting cases. First, we look at what happens when the rod gets really long. In other words, it's an infinite line charge. And second, we look at what happens when the rod gets really short. And we ask whether or not the result makes physical sense. So to get started, you can see we've already oriented our rod along the y-axis, and it's bisected by the x-axis. Our observation point sits along the x-axis, and the lower end of the rod is located at y equals negative L over 2, and the upper end at y equals positive L over 2. Now the way to get a handle on the problem is to break it up into infinitesimal point charges, and those are called dQs. Each one of those dQs contributes a little bit to the total electric field observed at our observation point at distance d from the rod. So we can see that electric field contribution, that's dE pointing up and to the right. And what we want to do is add together all those vector contributions to the total electric field as dQ goes all the way from the bottom of the rod up to the top of the rod. The first thing we realize is that the y component of that total is going to be zero by symmetry. Because our observation point is exactly along the perpendicular bisector of this rod, the dQs giving upward contributions to dE are exactly balanced by the dQs giving downward contributions to the total electric field. And the only survivor here is the x component, so that's the only part we have to pay attention to. So we want to find the x component of the electric field due to this little point charge dq located at a position of y. And then we should be able to set up an integral to add up all of those contributions for all the dqs from the bottom of the rod to the top. Now there are a couple notes we have to get through before we start setting things up. First, it's convenient to have a name for the total charge on the rod and we're going to call that q. Second is a reminder of what the linear charge density lambda means. So lambda is the total charge divided by the length of the rod. This means we can get the total charge by taking the charge density and multiplying by the length of the rod. And in particular, we can find the size of that little charge dq by taking the charge density lambda and multiplying by the length of that little charge dq, which is the differential length dy. So with all of that said, we can begin setting up our integral. So we're going to start by finding the magnitude of dE and then we'll figure out the x component of that. So we just apply our old formula for the electric field around a point charge. And that's a 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 out in front. And then the size of the charge, which is differential here, so that's dq. And then divided by the distance between the charge and the observation point. So I'm just using an r for that momentarily. And we can write that r in terms of the parameters of the problem. Here's r, the distance between dq and the observation point. And I can see that's the hypotenuse of a right triangle. So it looks like r is the square root of d squared plus y squared, but we're squaring that. So we end up with a d squared plus y squared in the denominator. Next, what we're actually interested in is just the x component of that electric field. We already know all the y components are going to add to zero, and we're just interested in adding up all the x components to each other. So there's the angle theta, and if we take dE times the cosine of theta, that would give us the x component of dE. So we can write dEx, the infinitesimal contribution to the x component of the electric field, is given by dE cosine theta. But that theta is the same as this theta in the right triangle. And the cosine of that is the adjacent over the hypotenuse, which is d over r. So we can write this as dE times little d, over the square root of d squared plus y squared. So we take our previous expression for dE and we multiply it by this new fraction, d over square root of d squared plus y squared. So multiplying in another factor of d squared plus y squared gives us d squared plus y squared to the three halves in the denominator. Our one over four pi epsilon zero is a spectator out in front. And we end up with a d squared plus y squared to the three halves in the denominator. And in our numerator, we have a d, that's the distance to the observation point. We're multiplying that by a dq, a differential contribution to the charge. 
And I think I'll go ahead and plug in that DQ in terms of DY right now. So I have a Lambda DY. And it can be a little confusing to be using D in two different ways. One of those is actually the distance to the observation point. The other one is the D that we use to signify a differential quantity. So I'll go ahead and rearrange things just to minimize the confusion here. I'm going to write it as a lambda times d over 4 pi epsilon 0. So those are all constants out in front. And this is multiplying a dy over the quantity d squared plus y squared to the 3 halves. And now we've reached this moment where the contribution to our electric field x component is entirely phrased in terms of a single variable y. And this means we're ready to integrate. So I can write down that the total x component of the electric field is the sum of all of the contributions. That's what integration is. It's a sum of all the continuously changing infinitesimal contributions. So I have the integral of dex, and I'll go ahead and move the constants out in front of this. So I have lambda times d over 4 pi epsilon 0. And then we have the integral of dy over d squared plus y squared to the 3 halves power. And then I have to think about the bounds on the variable y. It goes from a minimum value of negative L over 2 to a maximum value of positive L over 2. So all we have to do now is calculate this integral. And as promised, this is a classic trig substitution integral. If you're not interested in seeing the calculus, you can skip over the chapter. But if you've had two semesters of calculus, everything we're going to do will be familiar. So here's the trig substitution integral that results from our electrostatics problem. And there's one thing to take care of before we do the trig substitution. I noticed that the function in the integrand is an even function. So it's a function of the variable y, and y is squared there. And that means if we replace y with negative y, we get back the same function. This means we have even symmetry for the function. So we can just cut the integration interval in half and then double the result. So I'm going to put a 2 out in front of this thing. And then we integrate from 0 to L over 2. So this will simplify our life at the end of the integral. The integrand is unchanged. That's still dy over d squared plus y squared to the 3 halves. Now the motivation for the trig substitution here is that we want to simplify what's in these parentheses. And we're going to use a trig identity to do that. So if I replace y with d times the tangent of theta, it's going to allow me to use the identity for 1 plus tangent squared, which simplifies to secant squared. So our trig substitution looks like this. We say let y equal d tangent theta. Remember, we also have to transform the differential dy. So dy is going to be d secant squared theta, d theta. And we'll go ahead and transform the entire integral to theta space and never look back. So we need to transform those limits of integration to theta space. When y is equal to 0, we have to find out what theta is. Well, when y is 0, 0 is equal to tangent theta, and theta is equal to 0. So that one's easy. When y is equal to L over 2, things are a little bit uglier. We have L over 2 equals d tangent theta. So we divide by d and take the inverse tangent. And this means that theta is the angle whose tangent is L over 2d. All right, so now we make all these substitutions into our integral. And we have all these spectators out in front. All these constants, we'll go ahead and cancel a factor of 2 while we're at it. So we end up with a d lambda over 2 pi epsilon 0. And then our limits of integration have changed. We now go from 0 to the angle whose tangent is L over 2D. And our dy needs to be replaced with D times secant squared theta D theta. And then the whole point of our trig substitution here was to manipulate that expression in the parentheses. So now that's going to be a D squared plus D squared tangent squared theta all raised to the 3 halves. So as we start to write the next line, we can take care of all these Ds. I can factor a d squared out of that denominator, but that's raised to the 3 halves. So I square root it and then cube it. That gives me a d cubed in the denominator, and I have a d in the numerator. So that all amounts to a d squared in the denominator. So cleaning up my constants out in front, I'm going to divide that constant out in front by d squared, which cancels the original d and puts a d in the denominator. So I get 2 pi d epsilon 0, and I have the integral from 0 to inverse tangent l over 2d. And again, in my numerator, secant squared theta d theta. And in my denominator, I have 1 plus tangent squared in those parentheses. That simplifies to secant squared of theta. And when I raise that to the 3 halves power, I get secant cubed. So our integrand is now secant squared divided by secant cubed. Well, that's 1 over secant. 
but secant is one over cosine. So we're just looking at the integral of cosine theta d theta. And of course the integral of cosine is just sine. So I end up with lambda over two pi d epsilon zero sine of theta. And this is evaluated from zero to the angle whose tangent is L over two D. Now looking at that lower limit, if I sub in theta equals zero, the sine of zero is zero, so that's gone. The only part that matters is the sine of the inverse tangent of L over two D. And this is going to take a little bit of thinking to get done. We wanna visualize the angle with a right triangle. So here's a picture of the angle theta sitting in a right triangle. And that's the angle whose tangent is L over 2D. So we can do that by making the opposite side L and the adjacent side 2D. This means the hypotenuse is the square root of the sum of the squares of these legs. So I end up with the square root of L squared plus 4D squared. Now I need the sine of this angle. The sine of theta is the opposite over the hypotenuse, which is L divided by this square root. So now our expression for the total electric field in the x direction is lambda over two pi d epsilon zero. And this is multiplied by L over the square root of L squared plus four d squared. So that's good enough to be our final answer for the electric field at a distance of d from this rod. Notice that we could also write this in terms of the total charge on the rod because lambda times L is just Q. So you may see the formula that way. So at the top here, we have the same expression we just derived by using a trig sub. And we want to look at a couple limiting cases for this. The first limiting case is when L is much greater than D. So that means the length of the rod is much greater than the distance at which we're observing the rod. Another way of saying this is that we're looking at an infinite line charge instead of a finite line charge. So what kind of approximations become available in this limit? Well, if L is much greater than D, then I can see inside of this square root that the L squared term is going to dominate and the plus 4d squared becomes negligible. So in this case, we get that ex is approximately equal to lambda over 2 pi d epsilon 0. And then we have this simplification of the square root piece. We end up with just a square root of L squared. Well, that's just L, and these both cancel out. So our L dependence goes away. And we arrive at this classic formula for the strength of the electric field generated by an infinite rod. And I can write that as lambda over 2 pi epsilon 0, and then just highlighting the dependence of the strength of electric field on the distance from the rod, I can write that 1 over d. And this isn't the last time we're going to see this formula. We can also derive this formula by using Gauss's law, so I'll post a link to that video when it's done. Let's look at our other limiting case. That's when L is much less than d. So what does that mean? It means the rod is shrinking to the point where it looks like a point charge instead of a line charge. So if we zoom far enough away from a small charged rod, it begins to look like a point charge and it should have the electric field of a point charge. Let's make sure that works. So when L is much less than D, we can say that EX is approximately equal to lambda over two pi D epsilon zero. And then a simplification happens again in this square root. If L is much less than D, then in the sum inside that square root, the D term dominates, the L term becomes negligible. And I end up with an L over the square root of 4D squared. That square root simplifies to 2D. So I can write my numerator as lambda times L. And then I end up with a four pi epsilon zero D squared in the denominator. Now all we have to do is remember that lambda times L, the charge density times the length of the rod, just gives us the total charge on the rod. So if our rod is super short compared to how far away we are from it, it looks like a point charge, and we recover the formula for the electric field generated by a point charge. That's Q over 4 pi epsilon 0 times D squared, where D is the distance to the charge. If you enjoyed this video, or at least found it useful, Check out another one by clicking one of the links on the left, or click the Zach's Lab logo on the right to explore dozens of physics and math playlists. As always, you can leave your questions, comments, and requests in the comments section below, and I'll get back to you within 24 hours. Thanks for watching Zach's Lab, and best of luck on your math and physics journey.